David Philip Vetter was born in 1971. From the moment he came into the world, he was already separated from it. His older brother Joseph had died at just seven months old from severe combined immunodeficiency, a rare genetic disorder that leaves the body defenseless against infection. Doctors at Texas Children's Hospital warned the Vetters that if they had another son, there was a 50% chance he would have the same fatal condition, but they also offered a glimmer of hope. If the child were born with SCID, he could be placed in a sterile environment immediately after birth, protected from infection until a cure was found. On the day David was born, he was put into a specially designed sterile plastic isolator, a sealed, air-purified chamber that would become his prison. No human hand would ever touch his skin. The plastic e-bubble was developed by a team of doctors and was maintained by NASA engineers who had experience developing life support systems for astronauts. Every item that entered the bubble, from toys to food to clothing, had to be sterilized using ethylene oxide gas and aired out for days. Even water had to be chemically purified. For the world, he became the boy in the bubble. But behind the headlines was a child, bright, lonely, aware. David's mind was sharp. He was taught by special educators and watched television through a plastic screen. He spoke with a rich vocabulary, asked complex questions, and dreamed of walking on grass and feeling the rain. But emotionally, he was isolated in a way no child should be. He could see his mother through a plastic wall, but never hug her. When she pressed her hand against the chamber, he did the same, plastic between them. Carol Vetter would dress in a sterile suit and reach into sealed gloves attached to the chamber to bathe or comfort her son. David sometimes lashed out. You lied to me, he told his parents once. You said I could leave the bubble someday. David's physicians, especially Dr. William Shearer, dedicated their lives to keeping him alive. Shearer believed that a bone marrow transplant from Catherine, his sister, could one day cure him. But tests in early childhood showed she was not a perfect genetic match and doctors waited. They had to be sure. Infection was a death sentence. At age six, NASA engineers created a mobile sterile suit that allowed him to briefly leave the bubble. It was a plastic spacesuit, heavy and loud. David wore it only a handful of time. He hated the suit. He told his doctors it made him feel like a robot. He wanted to be normal. At age 12, a decision was made. In 1983, doctors learned of a new bone marrow technique that might allow for a transplant, even without a perfect match. They revisited the idea of using his sister's marrow. After weighing the risks and with consent from the family, they proceeded. The transplant was done in October 1983. For a few weeks, there was hope. David grew stronger. He was more alert, more optimistic. Plans were made for him to eventually leave the bubble permanently. But then, his health began to decline. A fever, fatigue, vomiting. Tests revealed the worst. Catherine's bone marrow had unknowingly contained the Epstein-Barr virus, a pathogen harmless to most, but deadly to someone with no immune system. David developed a fast-spreading cancer triggered by the virus. Within weeks, tumors invaded his brain and body. He was in agony. Doctors, once so confident, could now only administer pain relief. For the first time in his life, David was removed from the bubble. There was no point in barriers anymore. He was dying. On February 22, 1984, David Vetter died at age 12. He died in pain, surrounded by those who loved him, suffocated by a fate no child should have endured. His tombstone reads, he never touched the world, but the world was touched by him.